Where was the she? The attendant she? Raise your hand. Um, okay, uh, people who haven't signed it, make sure you sign it. So, uh, first, uh, okay, people submitted their piece of work, I'm trying to get it back to you as soon as possible. I believe the 12th of October is the second piece of work, and that is a critical piece of work because, in the, I mean, basically, uh, what you were doing was gathering facts, and now you're going to try and synthesize this into a first draft. So, Doing that is, uh, I think, a challenging thing to do. And so you, you have to put a certain effort into it. Uh, the third draft is easier because it's basically editing and polishing what you've done based on the feedback. So that's the process. And hopefully at the end of this, you will have written something uh, substantial and um, uh, which... Um, is in uh, good form, good English. And if you do that once, you can always do it. Um, so, um, having said that, I, I think what I want to start out with are two more review questions. So on the review questions, I'm going to give you two more. We've already done, I think, uh, four. We're going to do five and six. Um, and these, of course, are the literally the questions that are going to be asked on the final exam. Um, I'm going to make a choice and uh, you're going to have you have them because I'm recording the lecture. So if you can reference the lecture where the review question is, you have basically the substance of an answer, not complete, but reasonably complete. And that's your uh, final exam. So, um, Let's do uh, these two questions today. The first of them uh, is um, Charles V attempted to use the Spanish Empire to recreate the Roman Empire. Why did he fail? Now, the Roman Empire, of course, is, was this unified uh, empire governed by an emperor and so on. and this was uh, Charles V's conception. So, in terms of making an answer to this, uh, first of all, you want to tell me something about the extent of the empire. And we know it was uh, Spain was at the focal point. They conquered Latin America. So Latin America, Spain, but also Charles V, through inheritance, he governed the low countries, Spain, uh, Holland and, and Belgium. He had, uh, through his armies, he conquered uh, Italy. And the Pope itself, the papacy itself, became basically a creature of the um, emperor. And then up in uh, north of the Alps, he had uh, the Kingdom of Hungary, the uh, large duchy of Austria were directly under his control. And he was the Holy Roman Emperor. So that was the extent of his empire. You could see it was enormous. Um, 
And um, the um, thing is that, as I've explained, he wanted, ideologically, he put himself forward as not simply the Holy Roman Emperor, which he was, but really uh, he aspired to become uh, Emperor of the whole of Europe. And that would include Latin America. Um, and, of course, uh, the inspiration for this went back to, to the Roman Empire. And there was this revival, as I will be explaining in the rest of the lecture. Uh, humanism created this sense of the grandeur of the Romans, getting back to the grandeur of the Romans. Well, he was taught some of these humanities. He was taught by teachers who were had this conception in their minds. So that was the way he, he literally thought of himself and dressed as a Roman emperor. So that's uh, the sort of ideological framework. At the same time, he saw himself given the medieval inheritance as the protector of the, the Catholic faith and the what was called the Respublica Christiana, the Christian Commonwealth, the emperor was the civil protector of the, um, the Roman Catholic faith, which of course was all about the unity of Europe and so on. Um, and so um, in all of this, uh, one should say that Spain was central because Spain had gotten a hold of the gold and silver, the bullion from the new world, which uh, financed this project. There were uh, taxes as well, but uh, this was uh, unprecedented uh, largesse available to uh, this project. And also, he had at his disposition the best army in Europe, based on infantry. There were, there were cavalry, there was artillery, but uh, this was unprecedented. They were equi equipped with firearms and rifles. <laughs> There was cannon, and you have a, uh, a regular army, which basically was the, uh, the best army um, in Europe. Now, why did he, that gives you uh, uh, the answer. Uh, uh, this is the project, uh, to use this whole base to basically control the whole of Europe. Why did he fail? Well, the, uh, the basic answer is, rivalry with the French and also the English. They, the French and the English, which were territorial states like Spain, uh, they didn't want to be absorbed into this empire. And they fought back, especially the French. Secondly, so he had to fight the, the French, but he also had to fight the Ottoman Empire on his eastern flank. Um, and there were continuous wars with the Ottomans, um, which uh, ultimately uh, exhausted him. But also internally, a revolt <laughs> broke out internally within Europe, uh, especially, of course, the revolt in Germany led by Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation. So it's three. Re there are three reasons why he failed: uh, the French and English the Turks, or the Ottomans, and the Protestant Reformation. That's your answer to question five. So now question six. By the end of the 16th century, we've been dealing with the first half of the 16th century in the last answer, Charles V. By the end of the 16th century, Europe was made up of a set of rival territorial states on a more or less permanent war footing. Was this a good or bad thing? Well, um, the, so the second half of the 16th century, it's clear that the imperial project, Charles V has failed, and what's emerged is basically uh, stronger and stronger territorial states, sovereign states, which is a new thing. It's a new thing um, in, um, in history. Um, and uh, you want to tell me uh, the main players, who were the main, which were the main territorial states around about the year 1600? Well, you know, it's Spain, 
it's uh, France, it's England. Those are the main ones. We've spent a lot of time on them, but you also want to mention um, some of the others, like Portugal was a sovereign state. Um, Holland, the northern low countries had broken away and it became a major state by 1600. It was a ma major state as well. But uh, beyond these uh, clearly sovereign states, and we could also add Sweden and the Kingdom of Sweden and Denmark, which had kings and uh, they had little armies and so on. They had so you have those states, but within Germany and Italy, those two countries did not unify into territori uh, territorial sovereign states as I've described them. No, Germany remained divided. 300 German states. And Italy, there were about uh, 10 or 12 separate states in Italy. Uh, but these little states, like Saxony, like Brunswick, like Bavaria, like Saxony, within Germany, and still having this idea of there is uh, an emperor and so on. There was an emperor, uh, but he had no power. Uh, the sovereign states, Saxony, Prussia, Brandenburg, Bavaria, that, though they had the power at a more provincial or local level. And likewise, you see in Italy the similar thing. There was Venice, there was Ferrara, there was uh, um, um, uh, Milan, uh, there was Florence, there were these, and there was the Papal State. So Italy was divided up, but they all had a court, a judicial system, a tax system, maybe a little army and so on, that's the way it worked. So we have these, um, these sovereign territorial states, which are the organizing principle, if you can call it that. And as I said, that uh, this was, uh, they were constantly fighting with one another. And I explained that war was a constant. There was always some big or little war going on in Europe through the 16th, 17th, 18th century, that's the way it was. Um, but uh, beyond the state of war was what we call the principle of the balance of power, the balance of power principle. Um, so um, uh, the, this, of course, the whole idea was that in terms of international relations, uh, to prevent any one power from becoming too powerful, if it became uh, too ambitious, too powerful, other states would form an alliance to counter, to balance the power of the state was, which was too strong. And uh, there were, this was operating already in the 16th century and continued right through the early modern and down to our own times. Uh, the major power that uh, the other territorial states were fighting was, of course, Spain. They were trying to prevent Spain from taking over the rest of Europe. Now, um, the bad part, was this a good or bad part? Well, the bad part was wars were destructive. If you have continuous war and uh, the population, the ordinary people suffered uh, wherever the war uh, intruded itself, there would be uh, a destruction, there would be chaos and loss of life, and so on. So it was bad. Um, and it uh, also was bad because the common people had to pay the price in the form of higher and higher taxes. Uh, the monarchies were running these wars, and uh, they were, were basically taxing people more and more heavily in order to facilitate these wars. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I explained last time, uh, war became increasingly ex ex uh, expensive because uh, the scale and the organization of warfare became more and more sophisticated. The armies were larger and the equipment they required, the logistics that they required, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ships, uh, the cannons, the fortifications, everything was more and more sophisticated and it cost more 
and more money, and therefore the state had to organize itself in order to supply this, and it came from taxes. So destruction in taxes, that's the bad part. The uh, more positive aspect is that um, the state, realizing that um, the people could pay only so much uh, by the end of the 16th century, first in Holland, but then spreading to England and to France, and elsewhere, the, the princes realized that they had to develop their uh, economies, especially for war. You had to produce all that you needed uh, 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 to supply the armies. But beyond that, in order to tax, you had to develop an economic base. So by the end of the 16th century, these princes and governments were uh, di directly stimulating and protecting their economies. Um, they would give manufacturers subsidies uh, to help them set up a big uh, iron and steel factories and so on. Uh, they would raise tariffs on foreign goods to prevent foreign goods from flooding the market and sort of undermining local manufacturers. And so there was a conscious understanding that the strength of the state depended on the economy. And we call this system mercantilism. It's given in the key concepts, mercantilism. And um, it became really um, uh, the way these economies developed. Of course, capitalism was the uh, mode of production and so on. There were the entrepreneurs, the middle class was getting stronger and stronger, but the kings were protecting them. The governments were protecting them. This, this is the mercantilist system, and Europe did see, uh, especially England, the low countries, and, uh, France to a certain extent, substantial economic growth, um, um, especially uh, uh, through the 16th uh, and then again in the 18th century as a result of these policies. Free trade as a principle only comes in really in the 19th century, the idea of, which is the key liberal idea of free trade and so on. They're always harping on it. They do even now. Um, well, that really comes in with Adam Smith at the end of the 18th century, first in England and spreads elsewhere. So that's the uh, answer to that question. Now, having, having given you um, uh, uh, answers to these two review questions, I want to now uh, go back to the lectures. And um, we were dealing largely with politics up to this point, uh, but toward the end of the last lecture, I began to talk about cultural change, what was going on, very important changes were occurring uh, at the end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century from a cultural point of view. And uh, we call the, uh, what was happening, the Renaissance, I explained. And the Renaissance had three parts. There was humanism, which was, uh, the name is, uh, one shouldn't sort of confuse it with sort of humanism as we sort of vaguely understand it today as some sort of moral um, moral sort of uh, cultural position. No, humanism was all about reviving classical antiquity, the culture of the ancient Greeks and Romans, scholars devoting themselves. Uh, you, you know that the culture of medieval Europe was based on feudalism and Christianity. Well, this was an attempt to basically go back to the culture of the, the Romans especially, but also the Greeks. And they were pagans. They didn't, they didn't, uh, they were not Christians. So they wanted, there was an attempt to revive, especially at the beginning, you see, it's the middle class, the rising middle class, the class that is <coughs> Uh, basically bringing in capitalism, who are attracted, and especially in Italy. 
it's in Italy, which of course was the, uh, the which was the the center of the Roman Empire, that this revival begins. It already starts in the 14th century, and it didn't start in territorial states. It started amongst the middle classes of the rich cities of northern Italy. I'm talking about Venice, Milan, Ferrara, Pisa, um, um, etc., especially the city of Florence, which was with Milan and Venice and Genoa, these were the main cities. There's where the richest merchants, the richest bankers, they lived in these cities and they made their money by trading with the Middle East and Asia across the Mediterranean Sea. So you have the, during the late Middle Ages, these what we call city-states, because they were so uh, wealthy that they basically controlled all of the territory for many miles around each of the cities was brought under the control of these separate states. And it is there that the Renaissance got going. Um, already in the 14th century, and under key concepts, and I'm learned the names, uh, the three uh, in the 14th century, the, the three figures, all from Florence, and there was a great poet, Dante, his successor, another great poet, Petrarch, and there was a storyteller by the name of Boccaccio, and they were the founders, because they were inspired by looking back and studying the poetry or the philosophy or the history that the Romans and even the Greeks wrote. So their works are modeled on people like uh, Virgil, poet, of, uh, Roman poet, Ovid, another Roman poet, or the plays of the Greek poet uh, Aristophanes or Sophocles, mm -hmm. or the philosophy of Plato. They look back to these um, truly great um, Roman and Greek writers, and they try to imitate them. And you do see that a lot of what is produced, I mean, I think Dante was uh, highly original, um, and um, uh, in a way, Boccaccio, likewise, but for a large, uh, to a large extent, it, it, they tend to imitate and closely follow the Roman and Greek writers. And um, you see that um, uh, who are, who are so uh, these are the, these even today the foundation of Italian culture because these people wrote in Italian. It's true that they were inspired by the Romans, but these uh, figures they wrote. Italian poetry and stories and so on, they developed the Italian language, these three figures that I'm talking about. But their successors, um, who were they? Well, they were, uh, many of them were lawyers who had a legal training, or, uh, they were highly literate, so they were lawyers who tried to sort of follow Dante, Boccaccio, and so on, and also imitate the classics, but also schoolmasters, teachers, because schools began to be founded um, in late medieval Italy and all over Europe, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, where are their roots of these teachers and, uh, and lawyers? They lie in the middle class. Their fathers were merchants, or their grandfathers were merchants. And so we should see this as an expression of this new culture, uh, humanism, harking back to antiquity, but it's clearly connected with uh, the life as experienced in the cities rather than in the countryside. It's, a, it's, it's an expression of an urban middle-class culture. Now I want to uh, simply note that it was greatly reinforced this uh, humanist culture when printing came on screen. And I made the comparison with IT, with the internet and so on, because up to this point, uh, there were very few books uh, uh, during the Middle Ages. Uh, there were very few books. 
books had to be written on uh, basically um, uh, 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 you either uh, used animal skins or you used uh, some sort of, um, well, from the 14th century, you could use paper. But every book was copied by a copyist. There were, uh, this was a profession, copying books. Started first in the monasteries and then they became commercial by the 14th century. But to produce a book, it took months, sometimes years, to actually copy the book from one hand to the next. Uh, so um, uh, very few people had access um, uh, to books. But as soon as printing was invented in the middle of the 15th century in Germany by a man by the name of Gutenberg, um, the printed books spread by uh, like wildfire. Printed books, pamphlets, treatises, um, by the, um, in the period from 1453 to 1500, 50 years, something like 40 million books were, pub were published by printing presses, which were businesses that set up small businesses for the most part. Some, there were a few big ones, but many small businesses. So there was this huge print, new industry that developed, and it was a capitalist enterprise. These were capitalist enterprises. So um, that, uh, and that uh, uh, partly, a lot of uh, what was printed was religious. It was Christian. People wanted prayer books and stuff like that. But uh, there were a lot of these uh, humanists who published works, or they published um, some of the, uh, the writings of the ancient writers, like Plato was put into print, Cicero was put into print, Seneca was put into print, Livy, all over Virgil, they all were printed, and these books in the hundreds and in the thousands were, so this general culture rooted in the middle class develops by 1500. It's, it's completely new. And I want to say that um, I want to make the point that, um, uh, or to recall to you that this period, 1500, the date uh, is generally taken as the date of modern times. And I believe uh, that is uh, justified because uh, if you say, well, printing, the emergence of the territorial state, the discovery of the New World, um, the um, development of the Renaissance, the fine arts, um, that uh, there's so much new stuff happening suddenly that people actually did uh, feel, and they said, there were writers at the time who said, we are living in new times. They felt that this is no longer the Middle Ages, where we've entered into some new period. We've entered, and some of them even use the term modernity. They had the, uh, some real sense of this. And uh, we call this a change in the spirit of the times. And we, especially uh, the term zeitgeist, which literally means that, it's German. The zeitgeist changed, and it affected people's psychology. They felt, people uh, felt that they were living in new times. Um, and uh, partly I'm harping on this because I think we are ourselves experiencing enormous change. And it, to me at least, and I speak to others as well, it does feel that it's different from uh, what we, we have lived through modern modernity, through modern time. Something else is happening. What it is, I'm not quite clear, but Something is going on. We just and things feel just strange, out of sorts. It's not people are clinging on. Certainly, most people are trying to cling on to the past and the way they live, what they think. Uh, that that's very common, but um, it's becoming increasingly impossible to do that. And so I think we're living through a, a kind of a, a strange new period. Is the way I would put it. I'll leave it at that. Um, now, um, 
what was the actual content of the sort of uh, the values of these uh, humanists? What were they uh, sort of expounding? Well, uh, I explained that um, the um, the culture of the Middle Ages was all about Christianity, preparing yourself for the other, for the next world, uh, not caring about uh, the life as it was on Earth. Life on Earth during the Middle Ages was hard, bitter, uh, brief, uh, and so on. Get down on your knees and pray, and prepare for the next world, because this world um, is a delusion, and uh, uh, the real, real living begins in the next world. That was the attitude that the, the, the church taught, and many people believed. Um, and when it, come, uh, when it came to the upper classes, the, the landlord class, the feudal class, well, they believed in fighting. Um, and fighting was a virtue. Being courageous in battle um, in, and loyal to the king or to the, uh, the overlord was what the feudal class believed in. Loyalty and bravery. And maybe a little bit of love on the side, but uh, loyalty and bravery were the central virtues of the landlord class, and uh, spirituality was the was what the uh, church taught and the, uh, the priests, and they were essentially the upper class. Everybody else was below them. Suddenly, you have this upstart middle class culture, which finds other values amongst the Greeks and the Romans. So, what did they taught? Uh, Spouse. Well, first of all, they they uh, generally took the uh, the idea that uh, the world is a good place. It's not a bad place. It's a good place, and in material possessions, indeed, wealth is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Accumulating wealth is good. It's not bad. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, being ambitious. Uh, being individualistic, um, uh, putting yourself forward as an individual, rising to some greatness, whether it was in the state, whether it was in the army, whether it was in uh, humanist literature and so on, to be personally ambitious. Somebody like Petrarch was famous. Fame became uh, a, an ideal amongst these people. And they found this in the Roman and Greek writers, but they saw it made sense to them. So their ambition, material wealth, um, but also the humanists sort of stressed um, um, a kind of practical, pragmatic uh, sort of rationality. You have to be aware of the world around you. You have to act in a rational way. Uh, you can't just go crazy into battle, or basically devote yourself uh, to the emotional and spiritual. You have to think about your position in society and what uh, politics is all right. They were very interested in politics, as were the Romans and the Greeks. And um, finally, I would say that uh, in terms of values, what was new, uh, different from the feudal or the um, church's attitude was uh, they believed in what was called civic virtue. These people who came from Florence, Florence was a republic, like the Roman Republic or the Greek Republic, and so they, they espoused what was called civic virtue, completely different from the church's idea of virtue, which is about spirituality and moral goodness. No, virtue was, was about... Uh, having a certain moral strength to serve the state, which is a form of patriotic morality. Uh, this, uh, it was the way the, uh, the Romans thought of virtue. The Romans' definition of virtue was sort of civic patriotism. Well, these Italian humanists, they espoused uh, this idea. Um, and um, um, so, that gives you some idea of what they were all about. Well, um, one last aspect of what many of them said, 
they came from Florence and so on, but also Venice and Milan and so on, was they were very critical. They were Christians. These people, for the most part, so far as we know, uh, they, yes, they had a different attitude uh, from the church or from the feudal class, but they essentially were certainly Christianity, Roman Catholic Christianity was the dominant religion. There were here and there some heretics and so on the ground. But for the most part, people believed uh, what they uh, were uh, indoctrinated with. The Roman Catholic faith was a monopoly. Um, well, um, at the same time, many of them uh, were more and more critical of the papacy, of the popes, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because the popes were, they said, the popes had become increasingly corrupt, decadent, materialistic, and overly political. The papacy had become essentially a political power. It had basically lost sight of its spiritual mission. And that was largely true, as you'll see. Um, uh, the popes were emerging as princes alongside the king of France or the king of Spain. They were practicing power politics. They were trying to create a big state in central Italy. And some of these popes were extremely cruel or, or decadent um, or avaricious. They became the notorious. People knew about their behavior. The Renaissance papacy was decadent, and everybody knew that it was decadent. Well, uh, so I, I said um, that uh, for the most part, these people were still, of course, they wanted reform of the papacy. Uh, but amongst the sharpest critics of Rome and of the papacy was another Florentine and perhaps the most original thinker amongst these humanists was a man by the name of Niccolo Machiavelli, Machiavelli. And he is the most important of these humanists because he was educated just like these others in the classics. He studied the classics. He was especially interested in their politics and their, uh, the histories that they wrote, this individual Machiavelli. Um, and Machiavelli was, he was a lawyer by training. He was a humanist. He spent his spare time studying the ancients, as I said, uh, but he was also, he became a high official of the Florentine government, especially, especially uh, specializing in external affairs. That is to say, relations between Florence and the King of France, King of Spain, the other, the papacy, the other states of Italy. He, he was sent on all kinds of diplomatic missions. He wrote um, uh, uh, diplomatic papers for the Florentine government and so on. And he ultimately published uh, his uh, masterpiece, which was called The Prince. The Prince. This is all, the key words are all in, in, in Hummler. The Prince, which is a book which is still read. It's, I think, um, it's one of the few of these humanist works that is still read because it is Unlike most of these previous work I've mentioned, it's highly original. And what does Machiavelli say in The Prince? Based on his study of the ancients and also his experience of the real world of politics, that he says, well, people, the rulers that uh, I've come into contact and so on, they all espouse this Christian morality and so on. They profess to be only interested in the good of the community. But as a matter of fact, uh, all that I've experienced, including the papacy, and especially the papacy, they're all about personal advantage. These politicians, they're all about ambition, avarice, power, power for its own sake, as much power as you can get. Um, and they pursue this without regard for morality. They are the, their morality, the speeches that they make, the public appearances that they make, this is an appearance. But behind the scenes, what they're thinking, what they're doing is all about gaining advantage at the expense of other people. Power politics. The ends justify the means. 
The end is power. In order to get power, you do, as an individual, you do everything you need to do, including violence, murder. He uses examples of this. Um, in order to achieve your end. So this is the famous sort of doctrine of the, um, the end justifying the means, any means possible to get your end, which is power. Power, seizing control of the state and so on is what uh, you need to do. Um, and um, this is a revolutionary thought. Uh, for him to assert in this way and he publishes this book, and people are reading it, and they're both horrified and attracted to what the man is saying, especially the politicians. Yes, this is what it's all about, so on. Um, they do this in secret, because uh, very quickly Machiavelli's work is uh, prescribed, it's forbidden, but people are reading it anyway. Power of the printing press, and so on. Um, well, why do I say that it was revolutionary? Because when you look at uh, what people said before Machiavelli, they said, uh, and here the most important uh, sort of uh, political philosopher was Aristotle, both in the ancient world and in the Middle Ages. And he said, the good of the community is the end of politics. In other words, the individual doesn't count, it's the commonwealth, it's the community that counts. And certainly the church taught exactly the same thing. The community before the individual. The individual um, uh, is part of the community. The community above the individual. And Machiavelli is turning this completely upside down. Where is he getting this? Well, he's gotten it from his political experience. But also I think you have to understand that this, this attitude is the, is the philosophy of the marketplace. And it's all about what the marketplace is about. Uh, underneath it, at the bottom, and I talked about uh, capitalism, if you want to succeed in the marketplace, you have to be tough. You have to pursue ruthlessly your, uh, your ends, which is the amassing of wealth. So I'm saying that there is a connection between the rise of the market and the rise of this political philosophy. It seems to emerge out of this milieu. And we know that Florence, the market was everything in Florence. This was a really capitalist city. So there you go. Um, and so uh, the, these ideas, uh, of course, came to uh, basically bec be, become the ethics of modernity, and especially uh, in the realm of politics, but also economics. Um, well, that's one aspect of Humanism, but another original thinker and 180 degrees opposite to Machiavelli was Thomas More, who in the same year that Machiavelli published The Prince, 1516, he published a work called Utopia, which means nowhere, Greek word for nowhere, Utopia. And in Moore was a lawyer uh, up in England, he was a humanist, studied the classics. But based perhaps on Plato, perhaps from accounts of the organization of the indigenous communities in the New World, which were being written about, perhaps uh, rooted in monastic Christianity, Moore got the idea, and remember, England is becoming a capitalist society. Well, he, wrote, he writes a counter-capitalism, utopia, and basically he describes a, an ideal England, which would be a socialist or communist society. That is Moore's utopia. It's, it's the first treatise, socialist treatise, that we have. Um, uh, Thomas More, the Utopia, 1516. And what is, to me, what is so interesting about it is how early this appeared. 1516. Capitalism is just getting going, and yet you have a reaction to the appearance of capital, in the form of somebody saying that, and the first part of it is a description, it's a criticism of the development of capitalism. He rejects it. He says, no, an alternative society would be a socialist society where possessions would be held in common. 
So uh, more again, like Machiavelli, is highly original. Um, now, um, Moore uh, was not an Italian. He was an Englishman. He was actually the chancellor of the English state under Henry VIII. Um, and we can say by the time that Moore wrote in the early 16th century that humanism had spread from southern Europe into the north. And humanists began to be uh, to develop in northern Europe as well as in Italy. It became a general European phenomenon. And the royal courts, the courts like the court of Henry VIII, uh, the court of Charles V, or the court of Francis I up in France, they called humanists to the court. Uh, and there was all this discussion about what the ancient Greeks and the Romans said, and uh, that beca it became the general culture, including uh, amongst um, people at the court. And it was in this context, yet, yet another humanist by the name of Castiglione, he was Italian by birth, but he served Charles V as an advisor, he wrote a book called The Courtier. So we have Machiavelli's Prince, we have Utopia, and then we have the courtier. This is all in key words you saw on. Just look it up. And Castiglione writes the courtier. And what it is, uh, there's uh, all these references. It's a, it's a series of dialogues between noble men, but also women. It's interesting. Men and women together. And having these they're smart conversations, dialogue with one another. And um, what uh, this is all about is um, how to, to ingratiate yourself with the king or the prince. If you're a nobleman, it's addressed to the nobility. Let's be clear. This is no longer middle class. It's, uh, humanism is being absorbed into the noble, uh, noble class. And Castiglione, he speaks the language of humanism, but he makes it available to the nobles. And he says, you need to study the ancient classics in order to gain the knowledge, the cleverness, the general learning, which will make you a suitable advisor and companion to the prince, to the king of England, to the king of Spain, to the king of France. If you want to succeed as a nobleman, you can no longer hold yourself up in a in a castle somewhere in the sticks. You have to be at court. You have to be where the action is. And you have to be an effective courtier. Court, courtier. Uh, and you have to recommend yourself to the prince. Certainly, you have to know how to fight and bear a sword because you want to become the captain of some troop and earn money. But you also have to know how to dance how to entertain, how to tell jokes, uh, how to quote Plato. You have to become an all-around man or woman. You have to become an effective courtier. Um, and so he developed this notion of civility, which education, restraint, etiquette, politeness, um, which um, sort of general idea of the gentleman or the gentlewoman. This idea of the gentleman, of the, ge of the gentlewoman, the all-around person, is developed by um, Castiglione, and it's all about uh, being an effective uh, courtier, the court. But this notion of civility, uh, it's important in that respect, certainly. Uh, certainly the common people in England, in Europe, uh, they didn't have any of these uh, these civil civility, they were crude and peasants and so on, coarse people, upstarts, like middle class upstarts. No, they weren't like these gentlemen and general women who, because of their civility, ruled over the rest. That was the way Castellani thought about it. But also, uh, this side, the ideology that he's espousing of the civility, of the sort of general level of sort of learning and knowledge, but people who, after all, are military people. This is the 
justifying ideology for rule, not only over the lower classes in Europe, but also over the indigenous people, over the African people, um, who, from this point of view, are barbarous, uncivilized, rude, um, violent. They have to be controlled. They don't have control over the taxes. So this is what I'm talking about, is the ruling class ideology of the Europeans here. Well, I'll um, fully develop this, and we'll get into the Reformation in the next class.